Hey, welcome to Mineral Talks Live, the weekly live webinar that brings you in-depth and in-person interviews with the mineral people from around the world. Mineral Talks Live is brought to you by a joint effort among the Mineralogical and Geological Museum at Harvard University, the Society of Mineral Museum Professionals, and Blue Cap Productions. Tune in every Wednesday and stay connected to your mineral world. Now, broadcasting live from beautiful Honolulu, Hawaii, the land of aloha, ukuleles, and shakas, this is Mineral Talks Live. Hello and good day to all of you out there, wherever you are. Today is Wednesday, April 7th. 2021, and we'd like to welcome you to another Out of This World episode of Mineral Talks Live. For those of you tuning in for the first time, Mineral Talks Live is the weekly mineral talk show broadcasting to you live every Wednesday. I'm Brian Svoboda, the president of Blue Cap Productions, and together with my truly exceptional partners, Dr. Raquel Alonso Perez from the Mineralogical and Geological Museum at Harvard University, and Dr. Eloise Gayou from the Society of Mineral Museum Professionals, also known as the SMMP. We want to welcome you to the show, invite you to come back every week. Our goal in producing this program is to focus on bringing together all of the different facets of our mineral world, from curators and curatrix to collectors, dealers, miners, researchers, artists, and the media that serves us all. We hope that in doing so, we show our audience how diverse our little mineral world really is, and we allow everyone a better perspective of what others do in this world. As an audience, we invite you to participate and interact with us and each other throughout the live show. There are two ways in which you can do this, and both are located at the bottom of your screen in the form of the buttons you see in your Zoom interface. The chat feature allows you to type messages to everyone watching and participating in the show. So when you first sign on, feel free to fire off a chat message to everyone telling us where you're from. If you have thoughts or comments, this is where you can post them. During the interview, my guest and I may not really see all of your chat messages, but both, Ra both Raquel and Eloise will be very active in those chats, so look for their comments and links. When appropriate, either Raquel or Eloise may address us directly with some of your questions, so if you have a question on what we're discussing, this is the place to ask it. The second way to interact is with the Q&A function. This allows you to submit general questions that we'll try to answer at the end of the interview. Finally, at about 40 minutes into the program, you may see a window pop up on the screen asking a bunch of questions for our weekly poll. This is one of our favorite parts of the show as it allows us to learn small, random, and oftentimes interesting little facts about our guests. And now that all of that is out of the way, let's start today's show. Today's guest is broadcasting to us live from NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. And for any fan of the United States space program, you know how important Houston is to us. She is a mission exploration scientist with a PhD in geology, and she works directly with the Curiosity rover that is currently operating on the red planet of Mars. It is my extreme pleasure to welcome Dr. Elizabeth Rampey to our show today. Yeah, to our show today. Liz, welcome to the show. How are you? Uh, I'm doing great. Uh, great to be here, Brian. And um, actually, I'm not at the NASA Johnson Space Center today. Um, I'm in Houston at my house because, uh, unfortunately, uh, we, because of COVID, a lot of us aren't uh, allowed to go to our labs. Ah, well, okay. That makes sense. The mirror on the wall behind you doesn't look like it's NASA approved, but uh, okay, yeah. I get it. <laughs> yeah, the cat is also just over there, so he might make an appearance. Well, let's hope we don't have a catastrophe in the middle of the interview. <laughs> <laughs> wink, wink. Hey, Liz, I always love to turn back the clock on our guests because I'm a big fan of origin stories, so let's go ahead and do this to you. I'm curious, like, what got you into mineral research and if there was a particular moment in time when you thought that's interesting and something you'd like to understand better maybe I think this is something I want to spend the rest of my life investigating. Yeah it, it was uh, sort of a, a slow um, uh, entry into mineralogy. I, I really um, got interested in the natural world uh, through my parents. Uh, my dad is uh, an environmental biologist and my mom is an archaeologist and I grew up in Denver, Colorado. And so we would go uh, hiking and camping. My dad was a big or is a, a, a big birder. So one of my earliest memories is actually going to look at uh, hummingbirds in, in southern Arizona. 
Um, so, you know, I, I was very much interested in the natural world um, and from a very early age was really interested in dinosaurs, like a lot of, you know, kids who are interested in science. And so when I went to undergraduate school, um, you know, I thought I was going to study chemistry. I loved chemistry in, in high school, uh, but there was a um, freshman class on uh, dinosaur evolution uh, through the geology department. And, you know, I remembered my love of dinosaurs and, you know, didn't think I would do anything with it, but just thought it would be a fun class. And after that class, I was like, whoa, I need to look into geology more. And actually the second class, second geology class I took was mineralogy and just being introduced uh, to uh, mineralogy and my interest in chemistry and being able to apply chemistry to geology, I just thought it was so interesting. And my, um, my uh, mineralogy professor, Rich April, so I went to Colgate University in upstate New York. Uh, he invited me to do uh, uh, research uh, as a sophomore. And uh, he studied uh, clay minerals in soils in the Adirondacks. And so I did a lot of uh, clay separations, clay treatments and x-ray diffraction, x-ray fluorescence on these materials. And I just thought it was so cool how you could see that the uh, swelling clays, smectites changed uh, their structure with these different um, chemical treatments and heat treatments. And it was really after that, that I, I knew that um, mineralogy uh, was something for me. Fantastic. So was that field experience actually a, um, I know that you, you said that you were incredibly interested, but then you, you went out and you had that field experience. How much more did that field experience push you into the certainty of, of following, uh, following forth in uh, geology? Yeah, that's a great question because yeah, you're right. You know, growing up, I was really into being in the outdoors and then finding geology and realizing that you get to spend a lot of time outdoors if you're uh, lucky enough to be a field geologist or a geologist who gets to do field work. Uh, so yeah, so my, I think it was the summer between my sophomore and my junior years, uh, I did the uh, uh, off-campus 10-week uh, uh, geology field camp. And we went from uh, the Adirondacks in New York, uh, all the way out west, we drove to uh, Colorado and studied the Morrison Formation, which is very famous for its, its dinosaurs uh, in um, uh, just outside of Denver. Uh, and then we went to Utah and got to hike and, and study in national parks like Arches and Zion and went up to Wyoming to the Wind River Range. And it was, it was not easy but it was incredible. And yeah, you're right. That field experience is something that also really sealed the deal for me. Oh, I love it. I love it. So it's, it's getting your hands dirty and really getting in there where, well, uh, paleontology's world's loss is our win. So glad <laughs> on the side. <laughs> now, Liz, you're currently the deputy PI and that's a uh, principal investigator of the, um, the Kemin instrument on the Curiosity Mars rover that landed on Mars back in 2012. And just to clarify for our audience, this is the Curiosity rover that we're talking about, not about not the Perseverance rover that just landed about two months ago. So tell us a little bit about the Curiosity rover and how it differs from the Perseverance and what it is that you do with Curiosity. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, like you said, Curiosity uh, it landed in August 2012 uh, in Gale Crater, and I think I have some slides maybe that yeah. uh, might help show uh, what Curiosity is doing and, and uh, uh, what we're studying on Mars. So if you go to the second slide or the next slide. Yeah, so we landed in Gale Crater, which is an impact basin. Uh, so it formed when a, a, an asteroid hit the surface of Mars. It's about uh, 90 miles or 150 kilometers in diameter. And what's really interesting about Gale Crater and why we went to this place in, uh, to begin with is that there's this mountain in the middle of the crater that we call Mount Sharp. It's about uh, five kilometers tall and it's made up of layered uh, sedimentary rock. 
Uh, and we know from orbital infrared spectroscopy that the lowermost layers of this mountain uh, show a change in mineralogy that suggests that there was a change in environment um, around three and a half billion years ago when these sediments were deposited. So if you go to the next slide, and so I'm just going to zoom into these lowermost layers of Mount Sharp and go to the next slide. Uh, so this is those lowermost layers of Mount Sharp and these different colors represent uh, different minerals that have been uh, identified through uh, orbital infrared spectroscopy. So some of these layers are enriched in uh, the iron three plus oxide hematite. Um, uh, some of these layers, the one in green, are enriched in clay minerals, specifically smectite, and, and others are enriched in um, magnesium sulfate salts. And so this white line represents Curiosity's Traverse. Uh, we are close to that transition between the green uh, and the yellow um, colors here. And so we're studying um, these sediments uh, uh, and uh, the, the change in mineralogy uh, to really understand how these um, uh, environments uh, may have changed over time. So the idea is that uh, Mars gradually dried out uh, where there was abundant fresh liquid water causing the precipitation of, of smectites. Uh, and then we had um, more evaporative environments causing the precipitation of sulfates. If you go to the next slide, Brian. Well, now, Liz, I'm sorry, before we go to the next right, slide, um, I was fascinated by this in our pre-interview talk. Um, now, you had described these different colored regions as uh, uh, different regions that you were able to identify and classify according to uh, instrument readings taken from a, uh, an orbital position over Mars. Can you talk very briefly about that? Yes, of course. Uh, so there are a, a few uh, orbital instruments that are um, uh, either active now or have been in the recent past uh, that have uh, uh, infrared spectrometers. And uh, in different wavelength ranges, we can detect different mineral uh, vibrations. So in the visible to near infrared, so uh, relatively short wavelengths, uh, we can see um, uh, or we can detect mineral uh, hydroxyl vibrations within uh, crystal structures. And so that allows us to uh, detect and identify things like uh, phyllosilicates. Uh, and so we can separate things like kaolinite from smectite and we can separate even montmorillonite from natronite. Uh, we can also see hydrated minerals, so things like uh, gypsum uh, and bassanite. At slightly longer wavelengths in the thermal or mid-infrared, um, this is where we get uh, bond vibrations in things like silicates, uh, sulfates, uh, iron oxides, uh, and so we can detect those types of minerals um, at longer wavelengths. But also at uh, short um, visible wavelengths, we can also detect things like iron oxides. That is fascinating. So, I mean, of course, me, I'm not a scientist at all. And so, so that you could map all this out and plan exactly where you want your rover to go before it even lands there is absolutely fascinating. I don't know if you have in your presentation why Gale Crater was chosen or not. If it is, then we can move on. If not, then maybe you can explain that uh, very quickly. Yeah, and, and the reason is uh, because of these mineral detections. Uh, these okay. mineral detections have been uh, seen in different locations across the planet. Um, uh, but in Gale Crater, we get this beautiful stratigraphy uh, where the clay minerals are outcropping just below uh, the, min uh, the layers that have sulfate salts. And so we're studying this uh, transition with curiosity. Fantastic. And the area that we have outlined in red on my screen right now, that was chosen because of uh, the, the slope that would give you easier access to the different, um, the different layers, the different topographies. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Great question. Yeah, so that um, uh, ellipse there is our landing ellipse. So we actually landed on the plains of Gale Crater because it is safer uh, to land uh, um, a rover on some flat ground rather than on some steep slopes. 
And I think if you advance a few slides, there's um, a rover traverse. But yes, you know. there is. Um, let me ask you one one thing. Sorry, I keep doing this. Let me ask you one thing before we get there. My understanding is that the rover landed within what, like a mile and a half of where you had targeted uh, before it yes. launched. Yeah, so the engineers at uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory uh, in Pasadena, California are, are incredible. They're superheroes. Um, so uh, yeah, we were able to land uh, very close um, to our original landing spot or our target landing spot. Uh, and in fact, I, I don't know the specs for Perseverance, but Perseverance had um, a, a, a brand new navigation system uh, that uh, allowed it to, um, uh, I wish I knew the how close it was to the original uh, uh, landing spot, but uh, Perseverance was was much much closer uh, wow. to a landing spot than Curiosity was. And sorry to put you on the spot, what but what is the distance? And we, you know we could look this up, but what is the distance between Earth and Mars? Yeah, it's about three hundred million miles, like a little less than that. So three hundred million miles and. NASA's JPL laboratory can land that within with the curiosity a mile and a half of the target and even closer now. I mean, mind blowing. It's incredible. And I, I think we have a couple questions from the audience that uh, Eloise wants to ask. Yes, that's why I was popping up here. As we were looking at the, um, just the layered map that you had on your diagram, Brian. Uh, yeah. Francis was asking if the um, emitted areas were just precipitate or oxidation products. Yeah, it's a great question. And we are studying uh, some of these layers. We have studied some of these layers in situ. So with the uh, hematite bearing uh, unit, uh, we think that it is a hematite cement. Uh, we think it is a diagenetic um, maybe a late diagenetic product, so uh, something after the sediments were deposited. And something that I, I haven't talked about yet is how these sediments were deposited. Uh, many of them were deposited in lake environments about three and a half billion years ago. And so for this hematite unit, we think that this is a late uh, uh, diagenetic event. Uh, for the clay minerals, we aren't entirely sure. Um, uh, a lot of us have hypothesized that they are early diagenetic uh, products, so um, precipitated when the lake waters were present. Uh, they, uh, others have speculated that they uh, also might be detrital, so brought in from uh, another uh, source region. Okay. okay, and perfect. I think that's the right transition for the next question. Um, someone is asking, what does suggest the envi uh, evaporite environment? Uh, so, uh, sorry, we asked that one more time. What suggests an ev evaporitic environment? Great question. Uh, and it is the minerals themselves. Uh, so the fact that they we see these, um, you know, salts uh, suggest that they uh, might have precipitated from evaporating, um, uh, evaporating fluids. Uh, we haven't seen a lot of, um, uh, evidence in situ for evaporative environments. You know, we, we want to see those, um, you know, maybe gypsum crystals that uh, are, are forming within the sediments. And, and we might we see a little bit of evidence uh, for that here and there, uh, but not abundant evidence. And so as we transition from this clay mineral bearing unit to the sulfate salt bearing unit, uh, we're really keeping our eyes peeled for uh, uh, those um, macroscopic uh, pieces of evidence for uh, uh, evaporative environments. Great, thank you. And there's less, one last question and, and then I will leave you uh, moving forward. Uh, Adolfo is asking if you have a uh, jarosite in that area. <gasps> questions keep popping in, so it's gonna be difficult. I'm gonna stop here for now. Great question, another great question. And in fact, we have found jarosite uh, with uh, the Kemin X-ray diffractometer. Uh, we found it in a few different drill holes. Uh, I think its abundance is up to about uh, five weight percent in, in, in one location. Uh, so it is present. 
um, but at relatively low abundances. And at, I'm sure as many of you know, uh, jarosite is a really important indicator mineral for us uh, because it indicates uh, uh, precipitation uh, in acid uh, sulfate solutions. So pH, of, the pH is of about two to four. So it really helps us um, uh, constrain those past environments. Thank you so much. I will leave you moving forward. <laughs> Liz, thank you for indulging us. Uh, I can tell everyone we're gonna we're probably gonna run a little bit long today because we're fascinated by this. So now let's finally go on to the next slide, and this shows the um, uh, the path that Curiosity has has traversed since uh, August two thousand twelve. Yeah, exactly. So this is the um, uh, traverse for Curiosity. Uh, so we landed in August two thousand twelve uh, out on the plains because it's uh, safe. Uh, and then we uh, drove to the southwest uh, uh, to avoid, you can see that uh, long linear dune field. So that's an active aeolian or wind blown dune field. And um, we found uh, out pretty early with curiosity that uh, we cannot successfully drive through um, modern sand, uh, we get stuck. So had to go around that. Uh, and then you'll see where we turned to the uh, south southeast. That's when we first started climbing uh, the slopes of lower Mount Sharp. Uh, and I have, if you click through some of these uh, next slides, I just have a few uh, images of, of outcrops that we came across uh, that help explain um, these sedimentary depositional environments in the crater about three and a half billion years ago. So very close to our landing site, um, uh, we actually uh, found this uh, conglomerate, so a coarse grained sedimentary rock, and that's on the upper left. And we were able to see this coarse grained sedimentary rock or this conglomerate uh, because of the retro rockets uh, that helped uh, Curiosity land on the surface. So we didn't land with an airbag system like uh, previous, all the previous rover missions like Spirit and Opportunity and Pathfinder. Uh, uh, Curiosity was much, much, much too big and heavy to do that. So we had what's called a sky crane. Uh, so it was a separate vehicle that had some um, uh, uh, retro rockets and the rover uh, descended on a system of cables. Uh, the rover was placed on the surface, the cables were cut, and then that um, sky crane went and crashed um, somewhere else uh, safely. Uh, and so those uh, retro rockets brushed away a lot of the surface dust and sediment to reveal uh, these gorgeous uh, conglomerates. And I'm sure as many of you know, uh, conglomerates are typically uh, uh, form in higher energy environments and the uh, uh, the pebbles in this conglomerate are well rounded, and so this indicates a deposition in a river uh, that was uh, maybe about a meter deep. I love the fact that you named the landing site after Ray Bradbury, a famous uh, science fiction slash fantasy author who actually wrote the Martian Chronicles. So uh, that's a nice ode to him. I understand he passed away about two months before um, the rover landed. Yeah, very sadly, but um, it's, you know, I'm happy that we could honor him here. Absolutely. Now, Liz, the sky crane that you're describing for the Curiosity, is that similar to the sky crane that we saw with uh, Perseverance that landed a couple months ago? Yes, absolutely. They, they use the same technology for Perseverance. Great, great. Okay, let's go to the next slide here. Uh, we're at Kimberly Sand, or we're looking at Kimberly Sandstone. <laughs> Yes, we are. And uh, this is just a gorgeous image of these uh, layered sandstones that are dipping very gently towards the crater. Uh, and this is indicative of deposition in a delta environment. So where a river was entering a lake on the crater floor. If you go to the next slide, I think there's a couple more Liz, images. Liz, oh. I got a quick question. All of these dots that are showing up on this traverse line, does, do those represent one day of travel? It, they represent uh, uh, stops along. Stops. Uh, okay. So, yes. Gotcha. Okay. So here's the next slide here. 
Yeah, and so this is when we first started climbing Mount Sharp. It was a, a place that we named uh, Pahrump Hills. And we had these uh, very finely uh, or layered uh, mudstone deposits. Mudstone are a type of sedimentary rock that are, are very fine grained uh, and are indicative of deposition in a lake. So these thinly laminated mudstones would have been deposited uh, far from the lake shore and these thickly laminated mudstone deposits would have been deposited um, uh, close to the lake shore. Fantastic. And I think there might be a, yeah. And then uh, we have yeah. old soaker here. Yeah, this was a really interesting find for us. You know, somebody asked about uh, evidence for uh, evaporative environments, and right. this is one piece of evidence here. Uh, so this is um, uh, the old soaker target uh, for scale. I think it's about a meter across, uh, but we find these uh, fossilized uh, mud cracks on the surface. And so obviously that is from the subaerial desiccation of these wet sediments three and a half billion years ago. Uh, these aren't really common or on our traverse, but uh, we do see some evidence for uh, evaporation on, on our traverse. That is, to me, that is absolutely fascinating. It looks just like uh, what you would see here on Earth in terms of a mud flat that had dried out and cracked. It is exactly the same to my untrained eye <laughs> for what that's for. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. That is so exciting. Um, do we want to talk about this? Oh, this is just a little cartoon to explain, you know, what Gale Crater would have been like uh, about three and a half billion years ago. You know, you would have had these uh, rivers and streams coming from the crater rim, probably from the melting of snow and ice up on the rim. Uh, and then those rivers and lakes would have been feeding uh, or those rivers and streams would have been feeding into probably a series of lakes on the crater floor. So that's all this cartoon is. Fantastic. And then Liz, what is the, now I understand that Curiosity had a two year mission and now it's been, it's been operating for about eight years and eight months. So uh, well built. <laughs> what is the future plans for Curiosity? Where are you going with it now and what are you hoping to find? Yeah, great question. Uh, so yes, we had a two year nominal mission. Uh, we have extended that many times now, which is fantastic. Uh, we work on a, our power comes from a nuclear battery. And so we do have, uh, you know, a, a limited lifetime. Uh, we're hoping for another, you know, handful of, of good years of science. Uh, but on one of those um, slides previously, you saw their traverse of curiosity through those, uh, uh, you know, colored sediments, layered sediments. Um, and so from here, we are at a really important transition that we see from orbit, uh, this clay mineral to sulfate salt transition. And so we are really carefully studying uh, this transition, um, uh, stopping regularly, drilling probably every 25 meters uh, of elevation gain, uh, and delivering that material to the Kemen X-ray diffractometer to study the minerals and, and really figure out what uh, these depositional environments were like and how they changed uh, about three and a half billion years ago and, and whether or not they would have been habitable to uh, ancient microbial life. Well, now that you bring up an interesting point there and I think it's, um, I think it would help our audience because you educated this, uh, you educated me on this the other day when it, we had our pre-interview chat. The real, the differences between the curiosity and the perseverance. Perseverance, I think, is more in people's minds because it was very recent. It was just two months ago and we're and the helicopter has been deployed, but I don't think any of the test flights have uh, happened yet. So that's going to continue to be in our mind. And so there may be the question of, well, then why do we have two rovers on there? But they play very different roles. And maybe you could explain that a little bit. Oh yeah, totally. Uh, very different roles. They they both actually have the same body, uh, but uh, two different sets of instruments, uh, two different uh, uh, landing environments. 
Uh, so uh, uh, curiosity is really a, a habitability mission. So we are looking for evidence of habitable environments. Uh, and these are um, habitable to microbial life. And so we're looking for uh, everything that we know on earth uh, um, has to happen to allow life to survive. So we are looking for evidence for liquid water. We are looking for uh, the elements, uh, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, ox oxygen, phosphorus, uh, and sulfur, schnapps. Uh, schnapps. <laughs> but those are the really building blocks of life. <laughs> yeah, we're geologists, we always, we're always looking for schnapps. <laughs> so it's not only beer, apparently. It's, it's not only beer. Uh, and, and we're looking for organic molecules. Uh, we can do that with the sample analysis at Mars, the, the SAM instrument suite. Um, but uh, with Curiosity, we cannot detect life. Um, you know, unless we, you know, drove across and saw a, a trilobite, you know, then that would be pretty obvious. But uh, besides that, you know, we cannot detect um, uh, uh, microbial life. On the other hand, uh, Perseverance is really a life detection mission. It has instruments that can uh, image the location of, of um, elements within a rock. Um, it also has a, a Raman spectrometer that can look for uh, and identify organic molecules uh, in, in specific positions within a rock. And so you could really map out you know, if you if you saw something like a um, you know a, a layered bacterial mat uh, or a fossilized bacterial mat, you'd be able to identify that uh, with a perseverance and and strongly say that that is that life was once there. We could not do that uh, with Curiosity. So perseverance is looking for evidence of life. Whereas Curiosity is looking for uh, is studying the uh, habitability, the potential of the planet to develop and sustain life. Yes. Yep. Absolutely. Fantastic. Great. Now, uh, what I'd like to pull up is a image that I have of Curiosity and some of the instruments on board, and maybe you can explain what we're looking at here. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so Curiosity has a, a fantastic suite of science instruments. Uh, just starting up at the mast, we have an instrument uh, suite called ChemCam. Uh, it, uh, ha it can do a laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy, and so it can determine uh, uh, the elemental composition of, uh, of a target uh, up to seven meters away. So it uses that laser wow. to uh, create a plasma and has a series of spectrometers that uh, analyzes that plasma. And we have also some uh, beautiful cameras on board just below uh, ChemCam on the mast. We have mast cam, which is a pair of cameras uh, with different focal lengths. But that uh, those pair of, of cameras, that gives us those you know beautiful outcrop to horizon scale images mm -hmm. that you see mm -hmm. from reality. Uh, if we go out on the arm, uh, we have uh, Molly, which is our hand lens imager. And so this we can uh, get really detailed images down to uh, a resolution of, I think it's 12 uh, microns per pixel. Uh, we also have uh, another chemistry instrument called APXS. It does uh, X-ray fluorescence and um, uh, pixie. Uh, to uh, quantify elements in, in rocks and in soils. That's also where we have our uh, sample handling system. So our drill and our scoop, uh, our brush and our sieves. Okay. Looking inside, that's where we have our, our two laboratories. Uh, I, I talked about SAM briefly, uh, the sample analysis at Mars. Uh, it's a series of thermal instruments, uh, gas chromatograph, uh, mass spectrometer, so it can identify uh, volatile compounds in, in our drill and scoop samples, uh, and it can also look for organic molecules. And then ChemIn is the instrument that's very near and dear to my heart. It's a combination X-ray diffractometer and X-ray fluorescence spectrometer, and we use that to quantify minerals uh, in the drilled uh, and, and scoop samples. 
And so Kim in is your baby. You're the deputy PI of just that instrument. And there are similar, similar roles uh, that people play for all the different instruments. Is that correct? Yep, that's correct. So I'm uh, not only the deputy PI of of Kemin, but I also do um, uplink and downlink operations. So uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, I am downlinking uh, instrument health data, um, uh, diffraction data, helping to analyze those data and presenting them to the team, uh, and also uplinking uh, commands to the instrument. So telling it, you know, how long to analyze a sample or whether to dump a sample, that sort of thing. Fantastic. Now, I think we have a video of this uh, Kim in, in action. So let me go ahead and play that. And maybe you can narrate it. Whoops, that's, that's not what we're looking for. Or maybe you can narrate it as we're watching. Sure. Yeah, so after we have drilled or scooped a sample, uh, we deliver just a few tens of milligrams of powder uh, to our instrument. We have uh, 27 reusable cells that, it's, that are in a wheel configuration, uh, and then we transmit uh, uh, an x-ray beam through the sample. Uh, of course, x-rays are, are not visible to the eye, so just pretend you have x-ray vision today. Uh, but while we're transmitting that x-ray beam, uh, we're uh, agitating the sample, so we get all different grain orientations. Uh, and of course, uh, um, uh, crystals have long range order, and so these um, uh, x-rays are diffracting off of uh, off of atomic planes in the crystal to, to um, uh, create this two-dimensional x-ray diffraction pattern. Fantastic, fantastic. And then I'm gonna go back to um, this slide. And this absolutely amazes me. This is like, I would love to have this as a poster on my wall. I'm so fascinated by this. These are 30 of the drill holes. Now, is that the total number of drill holes or is it just 30 of an ongoing number? It's, it's 30 so far in the mission. Uh, we're actually approaching another drill site um, as we speak, and hopefully we'll drill again in, in a couple of weeks. But yes, so um, I love this image because of uh, the different colors. And, you know, I, I'm sure all of you online know, you know, how important uh, color is for minerals. And so even just by looking at the color of the drill tailings, we, we sort of get a clue uh, for what types of minerals we're going to find. Absolutely incredible. I love this. Now, Liz, what kind of research breakthroughs in mineralogy have you found on Mars over the past few years? Oh my gosh. Oh God. <laughs> um, how much time do you have? <laughs> Uh, as long as you want. <laughs> thank you. Uh, so a lot of these breakthroughs are thanks to Kemin. So this is our, our um, the first X-ray diffractometer on another planetary body. Uh, the first time that we can do uh, quantitative um, mineralogy down to a detection limit of about one weight percent. And so um, some of the biggest breakthroughs that we've seen, so, you know, we, we've talked about the image a lot of the, um, you know, uh, detection of uh, sulfates and clay minerals uh, and uh, hematite in very specific locations based on orbital infrared spectroscopy. Um, but in the locations where we don't see those mineral detections with Kemen, we see that those minerals still exist. Uh, so close to our landing site, uh, we detected uh, about 20 weight percent smectite, uh, but from orbit, uh, those clay minerals were not detected. Uh, so it, it really demonstrates that um, uh, Mars has this very rich uh, mineral history that we cannot fully appreciate from orbit alone. Uh, we also see some changes in mineral uh, on the order of even centimeters. So in, in wow. some locations, we have stopped and drilled, you know, just, you know, uh, a meter or less uh, apart. And, and we see some uh, distinct differences in mineralogy between those two drill holes. That is incredible. And I love the fact that the drilling and the sampling that you're doing actually helps justify the whole mission. I mean, you can't, as you said, you can't 
detect everything from uh, an orbital orbital position. You have to be on the ground doing the work. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, another big finding uh, uh, from Curiosity is uh, so, so, you know, we are studying these uh, lake sediments that are three and a half billion years old. Uh, Mars, I think somebody in the chat noted that, you know, it's a primarily a, a volcanic planet. Uh, actually, most of, of the volcanics are basalt, so mafic, low in silica. Uh, but in one location, we found abundant tritomite and cristobalite. Uh, everybody know, I'm sure everybody on, on this uh, uh, webinar knows that those are silica polymorphs. Uh, they typically uh, form um, if in a volcanic environment in more evolved rocks, so uh, rocks that are more silicic. Um, so what are tritomite and cristobalite doing in these rocks on Mars? And that's still a huge question for us uh, because these are lake sediments, so we don't know the source of these uh, sediments, but one hypothesis is that there were some local, more evolved rocks um, in the crater rim, and those were eroded and, and, and deposited that tritomite and cristobalite uh, in the crater. Another hypothesis is that there was uh, hydrothermalism, so warm fluids, hot fluids, moving through these rocks to uh, help precipitate those uh, silica polymorphs. Now, you bring up a very interesting topic to me that we discussed uh, the other day in the sense that when you're, when you're doing your experiments and you're studying on Mars, it's not just what you're seeing there, but you're drawing upon what you've learned here on the planet Earth in terms of uh, how, these thing, uh, how these things have formed. And that kind of jumps forward to one of our questions of you know, how um, the mineral world, the mineral com community, um, the dealers, the collectors, and everyone can work to better understand our, um, uh, our collective knowledge of minerals. But especially with the trimonite, and I think I'm saying that right, uh, um, there is information that you need in terms of studying its formation here on the planet Earth to extrapolate potentially how it formed on Mars. Is, that, is, is my understanding correct? Yeah, completely correct. Uh, and, and this is something that we're actually struggling with, with uh, tritomite. You know, we have found, you know, a lot of instances of tritomite in uh, evolved volcanic rocks, um, and, but we are having a hard time finding it in lake sediments. There are some uh, instances of uh, tritomite in lake sediments from uh, Mexico, um, we don't have samples of those yet, but we are hoping to go uh, uh, once uh, you know the pandemic allows us to travel. Uh, but this is a real opportunity uh, for the uh, uh, mineral community to help us and to help each other to really understand how these uh, minerals might have formed on Mars. So uh, this is a plea to all of you listening. If you know of uh, tritomite localities uh, or locations where tritomite and cristobalite are found together, uh, especially in lake sediments, you know, that, that could really help us out and really help us understand how they formed. Now, Liz, you mentioned that uh, tritomite was found in Mexico and you're hoping to go there. Do you know where in Mexico that location is? Because I know yes. uh, Peter McGough, he's not online right now. Uh, he was one of our past guests and a good friend of ours. Uh, who knows a lot about uh, Mexican mineralogy, he may be able to spearhead that effort. Yeah, it, it, I'm going to butcher the name, but it's like Lake Tecomoco or something like that. I, I think it is outside of Mexico City, uh, maybe to like the southeast. I, I've definitely looked it up before, but um, I'll have to, um, yeah, it's Lake T something. <laughs> <laughs> Lake, it starts with a T. Now, let's get specific. What can they, like, what kind of information do you need gathered if you can't make it, if they could get samples and send it to you, what kind of information do you need associated with that? 
Yeah, just uh, where it was uh, collected, because um, once we have the sample in hand and if we know the environment, uh, we're going to throw it in our electron microscopes uh, to look at the structures of the minerals, um, you know, where uh, uh, the relationship uh, between the tritomite and the other minerals to try to uh, infer a formation mechanism. Uh, we'll put it in the X-ray diffractometer uh, to get uh, tritomite abundance uh, and really compare that to what we see on Mars. Interesting. And would it be important to know um, uh, like some of the maybe adjacent um, um, geology, uh, other things that have formed near it, is any of that important to you or is it just getting the sample so you can run your analysis? Yeah, really anything uh, that they can provide in terms of the uh, location is super helpful. Um, okay. uh, my guess is if we found uh, a location that was especially interesting, uh, a lot of the chem and team members would just go. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Toronto uh, be damned. Are, I know, because uh, we are geologists and we've been stuck inside for 13 months now. Yeah, yeah, dying to get out. <laughs> I yeah. love all this work that you're doing. Where do you think planetary mineralogy is going? Yeah, another good question, Brian. Um, uh, in the short term, uh, uh, so what's uh, really interesting about Perseverance, uh, one aspect of the mission that uh, we haven't talked about yet is that it is the first step of a sample return mission. So mm -hmm. Perseverance has, um, has the ability to drill and cache uh, uh, rock drill samples for eventual return to Earth. So these drills are, you know, about um, maybe eight centimeters uh, long, uh, and it'll collect about 20 of them. Uh, and will uh, the plan is uh, for a, a second mission, uh, a fetch rover, uh, to come and, and grab those samples and put them in orbit around Mars. And then for a third mission to go and uh, get those samples and bring them back to Earth. And so hopefully this all happens in the next 10 years. But what's encouraging is that um, scientists at NASA head headquarters have said that this is a huge priority for, the, for them. Right. This sample return, Mars sample return is a really big priority. So I'm really hopeful uh, that we will have samples in hand from the surface of Mars in the next 10 years. And of course, with, once we have samples, I mean, the sky's the limit. Uh, we can... Uh, put them in a variety of instruments. You know, we've got our diffractometers, our electron uh, microscopes. We can go to the synchrotron and do all sorts of, uh, you know, uh, 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 analyses there uh, to really understand the minerals and characterize the minerals that are present uh, in their structures. I love your enthusiasm. I know all the the scientists and the researchers watching this right now are like, yeah, 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 that, that, that. <laughs> yeah, I'm totally into it. I'm like, I'm learning uh, transmission electron microscopy and, and going to start doing uh, synchrotron measurements just so that when they come, I can start doing some of those first analyses. Oh, I love it. I love it. Liz, I'm going to ask uh, Raquel and Eloise to go ahead and launch the poll. Uh, you're going to see a window pop up. You can just close it. And then I'm going to go ahead and ask you another question here. Um, because we're kind of coming toward the end of the show. Now, there was a wonderful moment when the former PI of uh, Kemen, David Blake, and the former deputy PI, uh, Dave Veneman, handed the reins of the program over to a set of younger scientists, Don, uh, Tom uh, Bristow at the uh, NASA Ames Research Center and to you. To me, that's a wonderful example of mentoring and paying it forward, especially in what I, kind of what I believe to be a predominantly male-centric field of science. I'm sure that had an enormous impact of you. So I'm curious to know what you're doing to pay that forward in terms of mentoring and preparing like the next generation of women who also want to become involved in science. Yeah, it's a, it's a really important question. Um, uh, in in uh, a lot of sciences, uh, it is um, uh, unfortunately male dominated, uh, but I think that is changing and that, especially on the Curiosity team, if I could show you uh, all of the scientists who are on it, you would see a, a lot of fantastic 
young women, which is really encouraging. Uh, And one thing I do is I definitely uh, uh, put effort into uh, bringing up that next generation uh, of female scientists. So I have one uh, female postdoc uh, with me right now. I have another one coming in the fall. Uh, I sit on a number of graduate student committees. Uh, Many of them are females. Uh, I work with undergraduate uh, 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 female students, and I actually just did my first uh, mentorship of a high school student uh, who's uh, here in in Houston, Texas. Unfortunately, it had to be uh, remote in in the fall, but she did a lot of really great uh, analyses of, of chem and data for us. Wow, so she was involved in actually doing analysis of uh, some of the, the results you were getting from Mars. Yep, absolutely. That's truly incredible. Liz, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go a little bit off script here and just because I think this really needs to be said. Uh, um, when I think of the Curiosity rover and how it was named, I'm absolutely thrilled to know that a 12-year-old student from Kansas City named Clara Ma was responsible for naming the rover. Now, Clara, she described herself in what I've read as being really, really shy as a kid. And she felt that her voice was unimportant. No one wanted to listen to her until she won that contest. Then the eyes of the world were on her. And she said that this experience totally changed her life. And one of the best parts of the ex- experience was getting to, to meet and speak to NASA scientists like you, Liz. And it made her realize that this was something that she could do in her life. She could become a scientist. Um, just in early 2019, Clara graduated from Yale University with a degree in geophysics. And then this, this shy kid, she went on to the University of Cambridge in the United Kingdom to earn a master's degree in science, technology, and environmental policy. Clara is one of those kids who can literally help change the world. And I'm so proud of Clara, not only for the fact that she's a woman, but she's also a Chinese American woman. And inspiring young children like this, this is the power that you people at NASA have. And as I told you in our pre-interview meeting, I am in complete awe of you people in the space program and i'm so honored that you would come on our show liz knowing that there are people like you at nasa who understand the value and importance of uh of diversity both uh gender and cultural diversity and that you accept the responsibility of mentorship for the next generation i honestly have to say you have my utmost respect and gratitude and i'm going to kind of get off the soapbox here and give you a chance to respond but really thank you so much yeah of, of course and thank you for bringing that up uh brian it's uh not only gender diversity that we're trying to achieve it's it's cultural diversity and that high school student that i told you about who is uh, you know analyzed chem and data and is actually now going off to undergraduate school uh, to study planetary geology, she is uh, a Black American, and so you know, reaching out uh, to uh, minorities and, and helping them uh, uh, get, by giving them that voice and that confidence is is so hugely important. Uh, I do a lot of outreach events at uh, elementary schools. Uh, some of them are in you know minority dominated uh, neighborhoods here in Houston, and it, it's really important to you know when. Um, a, a student asks a question, uh, and it's a particularly good question, to really uh, give him or her that um, you know boost by saying, "Hey, you know that was a really great question," or, or pulling them aside afterwards and saying, "You know, I, I'm really impressed by how uh, uh, engaged you were, and by those great uh, questions that you were asking. You know, I think you really have a knack for science." And have you thought about becoming a scientist? And just giving them that that confidence, like like Clara got, uh, right, can right. lead them to great things. You know, like a, a bachelor's uh, from Yale and a master's from Cambridge. It's it's stunning. You know, as a Korean American myself, uh, I'm married to uh, my wife, who's Chinese Hawaiian, and we have kids who are. 
they have enough blood to be considered native Hawaiian. And so they're a mix of Hawaiian and Chinese and Korean and, uh, you know, American, East European. It really, it resonates so strongly with me. And it, it, it's basically sending that message to everybody out there that, yeah, you can do it. You can, you can dare to dream and you can, you can achieve your dreams if you work hard on it. So really, thank you. Thank you. It means so much to me as a, just as a person and as a father. Yeah. Oh, of course. And, you know, um, minorities don't have the same opportunities that we do. So they, um, you know, really need our help. So it, it's not just, you know, giving them that encouragement, but also helping uh, to pull them up whenever you can. You know, and, and one thing that I love about this is also by involving different cultures, you're also incorporating potentially different perspectives that you may not have uh, had access to if you didn't get them involved. And so it's really, it's, it's rising to the goal of collecting the best of the best. Yes, it helps us all. Yes. Well, Liz, we are at the part of the show where we're going to go into the five quick fire questions. And then I know we have a lot of Q and A's that people are, are piling up, dying to ask you. So uh, let's get to that. <clears throat> Do you know how this works? I've got, excuse me. <coughs> Liz, you got me all choked up. <laughs> okay, so Liz, I have five questions for you. Each question has two answers. All of your answers are correct. We fielded these questions to the audience and they have tried to anticipate how you're going to answer. So I'm going to read them off. You have to respond right away and then we're going to see what the audience says. Are you ready? Okay. okay. I'm ready. Here we go. All right. Question number one, the right stuff or from the earth to the moon, which is the better program? The right stuff. The right stuff. Love it. Oh, one of my favorites. Uh, question number two, which should come first, return mission to the moon or first human on Mars? Return mission to the moon. Ah. Mars. That's going to set up Mars. I, I am dying to go to Mars, but we got to, we got to practice on the moon first. I love it. I love it. Uh, okay. Question number three. Now it's starting to get a little bit more difficult. Best beef selection. Dry, aged, or Kobe? Vegetarian. You're a vegetarian. Oh. oh so I that's... think that might affect a, a later question. Yes, it will. I've got two questions. Re oh, oh, I don't know how to respond to this. Uh, I know. I, I, you see, we need, I, can, I can pretend. Okay. Like... Let's, let's pretend. <laughs> Kobe. Kobe, OK. Gosh, okay. Um, best steakhouse in Houston, B&B Butcher or Vic and Anthony's? Vic and Anthony's. Ooh, okay. And the final question, and this is, this may really put a serious spin on the whole show. Liz, when you encounter a problem, do you say to yourself, uh-oh, or do you say, Houston, we have a problem? Houston, we have a problem. Ah, love it, love it. Eloise, do we have our answers from the audience? Yes, we do. Okay. Question number one, the right stuff or from the earth to the moon? Liz chose the right stuff. What did our audience say? It was a tight um, answer, but we got from the uh, earth to the moon, so wrong. They're both excellent, excellent programs. So uh, I will say that there is no wrong answer to that, but in terms of trying to predict what Liz said, Audience is incorrect. Okay. Number two, which should come first, return mission to the moon or a uh, human on Mars? Liz surprised, I think, us all by saying return mission to the moon. What did our audience say? Indeed, people answer return mission to the moon, to the moon actually. So it was a really good question. Thanks for asking that question. <laughs> That's you awesome. know, I love that question because uh, I, was, I was telling Liz earlier that one of my greatest honors, uh, other than, than this interview, was being able to sit down with uh, Harrison Jack Schmidt, who was the next to last man who ever walked on the moon. Uh, this was a few years ago in New Mexico, and I, I got to sit with him for like an hour and a half and ask him any question I wanted, and this was all interviewed uh, or recorded. 
and he is a strong uh, supporter of a return mission to the moon. So uh, I'm sure he's glad to hear that. And I love uh, uh, Liz's perspective on it, that we need to return to the moon to practice mm -hmm. there uh, before we go to Mars. Um, okay, surprising answer number three, uh, best beef selection dry aged or Kobe. Uh, Liz chose Kobe after much uh, of prodding because she is a vegetarian and I didn't know that. Well, people got lucky audience? as well. They answered Kobe as well, so. Okay. Kobe is good. Now I want Kobe for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> All right, best steakhouse in Houston, B&B &B Butcher or Vic and Anthony's? Vic Liz and Anthony's. Vic and Anthony's. Vic and Anthony's. Vic and Anthony's. Wow, I've never been to Vic and Anthony's. I have been to B&B &B Butcher, and I have to say that was superb. So uh, next trip to uh, Houston, when I come down to uh, visit you, Liz, at the uh, uh, Johnson Space Center, um, I'm going to have to try uh, Vic and Anthony's, and you are certainly welcome to uh, join us. We're going to bring the whole Mineral Talks live crew down there. Yeah, I'm excited. <laughs> Great. Okay, final question. When you encounter a problem, do you say to yourself, uh-oh, or Houston, we have a problem? I'm surprised by the answer of the audience. The audience responded, uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was that was my my favorite. So I think uh, if my numbering is correct, we got three out of five. So that's still pretty darn. Uh, we're going to switch it over to the Q&A. Eloise, I know that you have many questions to ask Liz. Uh, so Liz, if you have the time, maybe you can hang out and answer some of these questions. Uh, yeah, I'd be happy to. Many questions for you, Liz. Um, I think if we go back to the first slides we had, I'm sorry, I, there were so many questions, I had to stop them, but um, you know, one of the first slides that you had all the layered um, deposits and John Fox was asking, are the evaporites bedded? Good question, John. Uh, I don't know, well, uh, we do see layers uh, from orbit, so we do expect them to be bedded, uh, but we haven't approached them yet uh, and haven't done contact science on them yet, uh, so stay tuned. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, Vivian Gornitz is asking, does the emetite unit contain the so-called blueberries, the small emetite concretions? Another good question, uh, Vivian. Uh, so Vivian's talking about these uh, uh, blueberries, which were found by the Opportunity uh, rover in Meridiani Planum. Uh, the blueberries are uh, these hematite concretions that are maybe a, a centimeter in diameter. Uh, the hematite unit that, that um, we have studied does not have those concretions. Um, what's interesting, uh, uh, especially interesting about that hematite unit is that we actually see uh, the two different varieties, I guess, two different colors of hematite, uh, red hematite and gray or specular hematite. Uh, so, you know, if we went back to that image of all the drill holes, uh, we would see uh, some red drill holes up on that hematite bearing ridge, uh, but also a gray drill hole. Um, but all of those samples uh, had hematite in them. And so this suggests that that gray sample um, also uh, uh, contained gray hematite, which is um, more coarsely crystalline or has larger crystallite size than uh, red hematite. And on Earth, it, it, gray hematite typically uh, forms under um, slightly warmer uh, conditions. So warmer fluids, maybe 50 uh, to 100 plus degrees C. Perfect. I think that was a really precise answer. Thank you for, <laughs> for being sure. uh, so detailed. <laughs> Uh, this one is a really good question from Catherine um, Reksha. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not pronouncing your name right, right Catherine. Is it, is it difficult to find fundings to continue to obtain um, or fundings for continuing that mission since it's operating since 2012? Yeah, what a great question, Catherine. Um, and I was actually in a meeting uh, last week about uh, funding for Curiosity. Uh, and we are seeing our, our funding levels uh, go down um, a little bit um, over the years, um, as expected, especially as uh, Perseverance has now come online and is doing science operations. Um, uh, but there is plenty of funding for us to continue our mission and headquarters has been, NASA headquarters has been really supportive uh, of our mission, uh, probably because of all, all of the great findings um, 
uh, that we've encountered in Gale Crater. So Liz, we have a lot of questions, but maybe that might uh, have to be the last one. Um, have we ever found any meteorites on the surface of Mars? And that's a great question uh, from Arthur. Thanks for asking that. Uh, we have, actually. Um, I think um, uh, Spirit and Opportunity and Curiosity uh, all found uh, Martian meteorites. Uh, they are, or meteorites on the surface of Mars. Uh, they are, uh, uh, at least the um, uh, iron uh, bearing meteorites are, are pretty easy to see on the surface. Uh, they are, uh, you know, a very specific uh, dark color and they, uh, their physical weathering characteristics are, are very specific. And then, you know, when we uh, 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 analyze them with the uh, laser reduced breakdown spectroscopy on ChemCam, they show, you know, really high iron and nickel. Uh, so yes, we have, we have seen uh, meteorites on um, the Martian surface. Uh, and yeah, that's a great question. And I'm sorry that we don't have time for more questions, but I want to encourage everybody, you know, if you have questions, um, uh, my email is on the internet. I'm really easy to find. I'm elizabeth.b as in bravo dot rampy at nasa.gov. That's perfect. And like, actually like on that same question, so there's pretty much no atmosphere, like a very small atmosphere on the surface of Mars. So that means that there's no, there's not this crust on the meteor on the meteorites, right? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure how um, that uh, uh, how thick that crust would be. There, you're right. There's a very thin atmosphere. It's about one percent of Earth's, and so we I, I wouldn't expect to see that uh, crust like we see on uh, meteorites on Earth. But uh, maybe there's a, a, a thin one, a, a tiny one. And, and you know what, Brian, I, I hope you don't mind, but I wanted to ask you, what is a typical day or month or year when you are a scientist working on a rover? What's your days like? Because I, you have to drive the rover. Sometimes you have to sleep. And how do you take turns with your colleagues driving the rover all the time? Yeah, such a good question. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm not doing operations every day, you know, maybe it's like one day a week, uh, I'm in charge of the Kemen instrument. Um, and then there's, you know, 10 other people who also do operations for the Kemen instrument. And then there are, you know, 10 or 20 or 30 other people who operate the other instruments. Uh, it was, it was really different the first um, uh, 90 days of the mission when, you know, people were at uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pastina and living on Mars time. Uh, the Martian day is about 30 minutes longer than an Earth day. So, you know, you can imagine if you, you know, start your day at eight o'clock in the morning, uh, you know, in a few weeks time, you will be um, starting your day, you know, in the middle of the night. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, working on Mars time is, is really interesting. And I know, uh, some people who had, you know, two watches, you know, a, a Mars time watch and an Earth time watch. Uh, uh, so uh, that was uh, definitely a, a very interesting uh, experience. But now um, at the we operate the rover on, um, you know, a, a pretty normal day. Uh, our, our days will start anywhere from you know, maybe, maybe 730 in the morning Pacific time to like 1030 in the morning Pacific time. So we don't operate all night anymore. And we used to operate on weekends, we don't anymore. So it's a pretty uh, normal, normal nine to five job right now. <laughs> Excellent news for you. Thank yeah. you for answering the questions. And uh, thank you for sharing your ad address with the, all the public. And I, 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 you will receive plenty of emails. I'm sorry in advance, Liz. <laughs> no, I'm happy to answer them. Thank Send you. me your questions. Thank you. So much thank for you coming so much for and thank you for just making yourself available and encouraging questions we really really appreciate uh, for all you viewers out there we want you to stay tuned tune into blue cat productions youtube channel tomorrow when we are going to post the interview that we did with dr andrea stuckey from sieber and sieber in switzerland this was episode 39 and this is kind of a master class on minerals from switzerland absolutely fantastic program 
Uh, also tune in next week. We're going to have Alex Spear, a senior fellow over at the Mineralogical Society of America. He was the executive director there from 1995 to 2020. Just recently set, stepped down, but he's now the senior fellow. So we're going to have a fascinating talk with him next week, this same bat time, same bat channel. And before we go, I want to read a quote that's from Clara Ma's winning essay that she wrote when she was 12 years old, the exact age my son is today. This essay is how the Curiosity Rover got its name. Curiosity is an everlasting flame that burns in everyone's mind. It makes me get out of bed in the morning and wonder what surprises life will throw at me that day. Curiosity is such a powerful force. Without it, we wouldn't be who we are today. Curiosity is the passion that drives us through our everyday lives. We have become explorers and scientists with our need to ask questions and to wonder. So that's from a 12-year-old Clara Ma. So never stop wondering, always ask the questions. Liz, again, thank you. Mahalo from the bottom of my heart for coming on the show. For everyone else, have a great week. We'll see you later. Take care.